Okay, so um, a couple of announcements. The uh, <clears throat> next homework assignment's due on Wednesday. And remember last Friday we talked about the fact that the Winter Technical Conference is this week on Wednesday. And if anybody wants to attend that presentation, or hopefully the whole day, uh, that would be considered an excused absence from my perspective. I am still, however, going to have class on Wednesday because I, less than half the people here said that they were thinking about going to the conference. And so we're still going to have class, but those who people who do go to the conference, you can watch the recorded lecture video, and then I'll get information from Dr. Non, who was there, in order to excuse the absences. Uh, so any questions about Wednesday? And then Friday of this week is going to be an online lecture. Uh, we will not meet together in person on Friday. So today we're going to be talking about uh, empirical resistance equations, and we've already discussed uh, Darcy Wiesbach equation, Hayes and Williams equation. But just to put it in pers some perspective, we're going to calculate head loss uh, for one scenario with three different methods, including the Manning's equation, just so you can get an idea of why we sometimes bother with the extra effort that it takes to do the Darcy Wiesbach equation. And then for the second part of the class today, we're going to work an example where you're going to do an iterative solution using a spreadsheet template that I've just posted on Blackboard. Um, so if you have your computer with you today, that's great. If not, that's okay too because there are some hand calculations on that example before we get into the iterations and you can just follow along on a classmate or on the screen for the uh, calculation part of it. So any questions before we move into this example comparing resistance formulas? I think I've maybe showed you the link to this before, but if you're interested in a way to solve the Colebrook equation with your calculator, here's an illustration on how to do that. Um, the, uh, the approach that I've shown you in class was using Excel. You need to be able to solve the Colebrook equation during an exam scenario um, because, uh, I don't know, I may ask you an exam question on how to solve the Colebrook equation. So whether it's with a spreadsheet or with a calculator, you need to be able to solve that. And there will be exam questions where you could be asked to use a, uh, an Excel file as a starting point of your calculations. And so uh, the way it usually works during exams is that I'll kind of hang out in the back of the class to make sure that nobody's sending messages or emails or anything during the test. But just to put it on your radar, uh, if you don't yet have access to a laptop computer, then um, for sure you'll want to look at the schedule and identify the dates of our exams and get one ready uh, for those days. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention with the announcements. Remember the 2% of your course grade that comes from keeping and maintaining a binder? The first check is going to be on Monday of next week. So please bring in your three-ring binder where these um, you know, examples that you're solving in class and the notes and your homework assignments. Bring that in on Monday and I'll just that day for the attendance go through and take a quick look at everybody's binder. All right, so Darcy Wiesbach equation is a little more trouble than either of the other approaches for estimating head loss due to pipe friction. And the reason why it's a little more trouble is that the friction factor is dynamic. The friction factor that you use in the Darcy Wiesbach equation is responsive to the fluid. It's responsive to the temperature of the fluid. It is taking into consideration the diameter of the conduit. It's taking into consideration the velocity of flow. And uh, neither the Hazen Williams equation nor the Manning's equation takes any of that into account. There are just fixed. Uh, fixed friction factors that depend on the material, but not on the flow conditions. So um, Dar we Darcy Wiesbach equation is more effort, but it's typically considered more accurate because of all those customizations. So let's work this example where both the Hayes and Williams equation, the Manning's equation, and Darcy Wiesbach are all presented here in terms of their SI units so that we can estimate how much head loss there is over a 500 meter long pipe segment where we know that the water is flowing at a velocity of one meter per second and then the, uh, the diameter of the conduit is 150 millimeters. So that's within the range of what the Hayes and Williams equation is calibrated for. 
because there is this certain range of, you know, it's assuming water at 17 degrees Celsius for a conduit between 50 millimeters and 1850 millimeters <laughs> below a certain velocity. So this is within the range that Hayes and Williams equation should be pretty good, but the question is how good? So what I'll ask you to do is just do these substitutions, calculate head loss for Hayes and Williams, head loss for Manning's equation, and then the head loss for the uh, um, Darcy-Wiesbach equation, you're going to be required to calculate the Reynolds number. And of course, I don't have the formula for the Reynolds number on the screen there, but it's just simply the velocity in the conduit multiplied by the diameter of the conduit divided by the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. And for water, typical conditions, it's 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second for the kinematic viscosity. All right, so let me pause and just give you some time to calculate head loss by these three different methods. Okay, so um, the Hayes and Williams equation should give you 3.85 meters of head loss due to pipe friction. Manning's equation, as I've mentioned before, is most typically used for open channel flow. And it's uncommon for someone to try and estimate the effect of pipe friction and closed conduit flow using Manning's equation. Occasionally for flow through a culvert, someone might use Manning's equation simply because most of the time culverts are flowing open channel. Uh, meaning that they're not flowing full, but then occasionally the water level rises so high that you have water flowing through a culvert barrel that ordinarily wouldn't all the way be to the top. So in a situation like that, someone, because they've already got Manning's equation set up to estimate the uh, flow conditions when it's partially full, may continue to use it when the culvert's all the way full. But in any case, you'll see that there's a big discrepancy between Hayes and Williams and Manning's equation. Um, not an insignificant difference at all. So one's pretty low, one's pretty high. Darcy Wiesbach equation in this case is just kind of uh, in between the two, though not exactly in the middle. So for Darcy Wiesbach equation, uh, the first step, of course, is to, for the flow conditions, estimate the Reynolds number. Then with the Reynolds number, estimate the friction factor. Now, it's a key thing. You have to remember to put the same units in this relative roughness term, the K sub S to D. If you have K sub S in millimeters, but then the diameter in meters, then you're going to have an issue. Now, Reynolds number is unitless, but you do need to pay attention to the units of this first term in the denominator of the, Darcy uh, the Jane equation. So 0 0.024 should be your friction factor, and then when you put all that into the Dar Darcy Wiesbach equation, we get 4.08 meters. So, um, you know, Hazen's equation, Hazen Williams' equation is fairly close. 3.85 versus 4.08. On a percentage basis, it's uh, not a huge difference, but um, there are definitely scenarios where you need to have that added precision, especially 
in places with really flat geography where um, you're estimating the effect of pressure changes over long distances with very little uh, elevation change then every meter of head loss really counts quite a lot, and so you want to estimate it as accurately as possible. Um, I'll just say briefly that I, I think it's really uh, important for you to develop speed for calculations. And it's, you know, I, even though I have a calculator emulator on my phone where the buttons are in the same place as the full size calculator, I can only do calculations about half as fast on my phone as I can with the calculator. Something about just feeling the click of the buttons on my finger, I don't know why, but it, it allows me to calculate a lot more quickly. And there's tons of calculations in this class and many others within engineering. So um, especially in a situation like an exam where you want to go back and double check your calculations for accuracy, it just pays all sorts of dividends. if. If you get a calculator and become really good at it and kind of get into a habit of the way that you uh, break down large equations and put it in. You know, equation like Jane equation, um, the Hewlett-Packard calculator that I've told you about uses a, um, a numerical system called reverse Polish notation where you actually can start typing the formula in at any point in the equation. You could start by typing in 1.325. You could start by typing in, it just gives you flexibility on how you enter it. And that may be why I'm so much faster on the actual calculator than an emulator. But whatever works for you, you need to get really good at it because um, you're going to be doing calculations for a long time, many, many years into the future. Any questions on this example? Sure, yeah. In here, you can't use it on the FE exam, yeah. but uh, yeah, I'm glad to have you use whichever calculator you'd like. <coughs> All right, so this is the uh, other example they're gonna work, we're going to work on today, and this is the one where I said that there's a template file that we'll use in just a moment, but before that, there are some hand calculations that we need to look at. I think this is pretty similar to the homework problem that you've got, the, the last problem on the assignment that's due Wednesday. Now this is in traditional units, which always makes things a little bit weird, but we'll go with it. Okay. Um, so since this is, I think, maybe the first example we've worked in traditional units, uh, what's the unit weight of water in traditional units? 62.4 pounds of force per cubic foot. Good. What about the density of water? That's kilograms, right. So what's, the, what's even the units of density in traditional units? It's slugs per cubic foot. So it's like 1.94 slugs per cubic foot. It won't come up a lot. But when it does, don't be surprised when I start talking about slugs. Okay, those are the traditional units of mass. Um, now, what about a horsepower? What's a horsepower? Mm. One horsepower is 550 foot-pounds of force per second. So, one horsepower is 550 foot pounds per second. So weird, right? We'll, uh, we'll figure it out, but I just wanted to point out a few things. That So this epsilon that it's talking about means the same thing as K sub S. It's a measure of the roughness of a pipe. And it's not just because we're working in traditional units that epsilon is used here. Sometimes we could have said uh, the relative roughness variable was epsilon, even if it was a SI problem. But, okay, so that's the uh, horsepower. And then the other thing I'm going to write on the board here is that the unit weight is 62.4 uh, pounds of force per cubic foot. Okay. All right. So water is flowing from the lower reservoir up to the upper reservoir. And we're ultimately going to be applying the energy equation, but um, 
Yeah, so let me go ahead and write the energy equation now. So it's the pressure head at one, plus the elevation at one, plus the velocity head at one, plus the pump head. And this time, it's not going to cancel out. I've canceled it out on so many prior occasions, but we actually do have a pump this time. So the pump head term won't be canceled out. So the pressure head at two, the elevation head at two, the velocity head at two, and then there's the head losses, which remember collectively are local losses and the effect of pipe friction. On the diagram, we don't have any information about local losses. Like if, if there was a, the letter K was pointing to some like pipe bend, then we'd take into account the local losses because uh, local losses is K times the velocity head. That's how you estimate the effect of the local loss at a fitting or a valve or a change in flow direction is that the, uh, there's tables of K values if you know some information about the different fittings. But here we are neglecting the local losses and only dealing with the effects of pipe friction. So now energy equation is on the whiteboard. I'm, I guess on the screen now too. Now. Um, H sub P, the relationship between pump head and how many horsepower is being added by the pump. And this is confusing because H sub P, I mean, that kind of sounds like horsepower, right? But it's not. That's pump head. And so there's a relationship between pump head and horsepower. Here it is. Horsepower is the unit weight of the fluid. <coughs> multiplied by the flow rate, multiplied by the pump head, divided by 550. Now this is the, uh, the formula for horsepower, which is by definition only applicable in um, traditional units. So we have 10 horsepower, and let's first of all here, step one, calculate the amount of head that's added by the pump using this formula. So um, we have, let's go ahead and rearrange that formula. So we could rearrange it just algebraically. H sub P is 550 foot pounds per second multiplied by the horsepower divided by the unit weight <coughs> multiplied by the flow rate. So for our purposes here, it's a 10 horsepower pump. So we've got 550 foot pounds of force, by the way, uh, per second, multiplied by 10 horsepower. Oh, and that's 550 foot pounds of force per second per horsepower. So I'll write just here in English, per HP. And then we're multiplying that by 10 HP. So you see that the units are going to cancel. And then 62.4 pounds of force per cubic foot multiplied by the flow rate, 1.5 cubic feet per second. All right. So we can calculate now the pump head that uh, is being applied within the energy equation. So what we're doing is we're converting energy units. We're converting it from units of horsepower to units of, L of, of head, where head is units of energy, whether it's velocity head, elevation head, in this case, pump head. And so the... Um, The pump head that's being added here is 58.76 feet. So if we just look at how the units cancel, I didn't write all of the units on the PDF, but it is on the board. Oh, I've just gone under there. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Um, so pounds cancel out. Uh, Let's see, the 
seconds cancel out because they're in the denominator of the denominator. This is per horsepower, and here's the horsepower. Uh, cubic feet. Ah, cubic feet. Thank you very much. I was not so sure there for a second. But it does cancel out. So all we're left with is feet. So uh, it's adding 58.76 feet of head. Now, part two of this example says, Calculate the head that's available for pipe friction. We're going to do that with the energy equation. So remember, one is the reservoir here where the water starts, and two is going to be the reservoir here, the upper one where the water stops flowing. And so since it's open to the atmosphere, as indicated by that little triangle, it means it's a free surface of water in contact with the atmosphere. That means that there's no pressure head at one or two. And since it's a tank of water, I mean, at most, the water level's going down very negligibly and slowly at one and up very slowly and negligibly at two. So we can pretty comfortably cancel out the velocity head anytime your location is a tank. Uh, Z1, let's let Z1 equals 0 and Z2 is 35. You see here where it's saying the elevation difference between the two is 35 feet. So therefore, let Z1 equals 0 and Z2 is 35 feet. And what we just calculated is that we are adding, how much pump head was that? It was... 58.76, so 58.76 feet of head is equal to Z2 plus H sub F. So look at it this way. You know that the pump's adding energy. It's adding 35 feet of energy to overcome the elevation difference, and all the other energy that it added can be used to overcome pipe friction. That's where the energy is going that's added by the pump. The pump has to be there for two reasons, to overcome the elevation difference, so it's lifting the water, and then also the pump is there to overcome the frictional resistance imparted by the pipe to the water. So 35 feet of energy is expended on the elevation difference, and that means that H sub F, the difference is there's 23, 0.76 feet available to have the water overcome pipe friction. So that's H sub F. So any questions so far? So that lays the groundwork for this template file. Now the template file, what we're going to do is we don't know what the F value is. And why don't we yet know what the F value is? Well, it's because we don't know what the velocity is through the pipe. Why don't we know the flow velocity? It's because we haven't calculated a diameter yet. It's that same conundrum that we had in class previously where you know, we didn't yet size the pipe diameter, so we don't know the velocity, so we don't know the pipe friction. So we cut through all the uncertainty by just starting with a guess. And that's what we're going to do again. So if you don't yet have that template file, go and get that off of Blackboard. I've got it here on my drive. Okay, so I guess we're not going to, I don't think, use the horsepower because we've done these hand calculations to begin with. But we'll just type it in. 10 horsepower. Uh, the roughness of our pipe here was 0 0.00085. And the unit weight of water, 62.37 pounds per cubic foot. The kinematic viscosity of water, now these aren't metric units. This is traditional units. So it's a little bit different from what we are accustomed to. It's 1.22 e minus 5. So that's 1.22 times 10 to the minus fifth. 
the flow rate, 1.5 cubic feet per second. The pump head, which we had calculated, I mean, we could calculate it using the, uh, using the spreadsheet, but we'll just type it in because we calculated the pump head is 58.76. The head loss due to pipe friction, 23.76. All right, G, 32.2. And now finally, the length of the pipe segment is 800 feet. So anything that is in these cells, when we refer to it below, we want it to be um, an anchored reference. So that when we go down through subsequent iterations, anytime we're referring to a constant, it always looks at that constant and doesn't paste downward. Okay, so the friction factor, the first iteration, we're just going to start with a guess. In class on either Wednesday or Friday, I'm going to tell you how you can have an even better guess than just choosing something at random. It's called the fully turbulent flow assumption. And the fully turbulent flow assumption is basically, if you have a really big Reynolds number, then the F value would only depend on this K sub S to D term. But we haven't got to the full applying the fully turbulent flow assumption yet. So let's just choose 0 0.01. So that's on the low side of an F value, but we'll just go with it. Okay, so if that is our F value, let's use this formula now to estimate what diameter would be required for the conditions that are described. So it's 8 times F times the length. And I'll anchor the reference to the length with the dollar signs by pressing the F4 button times the flow rate. And anchor that and then square it. And now we're dividing by H sub F. Anchor that reference times G. Anchor that reference times pi squared. So PI, open and close parentheses, and then square it. And then I have to do a close parentheses for the denominator, close parentheses for the brackets, and then all of that is to the power of 1 fifth. The fact that I have, uh, well, it's maybe a little easier to read there. Okay, so if you have an F value of 0.01, then it's telling us that the uh, pipe diameter should be about 0.453 feet. Did anybody else also get that same diameter? Okay, I see some nodding heads now. If you don't have your computer, that's totally OK. You can go through this another time. But if that's the diameter, then the cross-sectional area is going to be pi d squared divided by 4. So equals pi, so that's pi times the diameter that we've just calculated, pi d squared divided by 4. How come I don't have to put parentheses um, like after the squared term to get it. Like how come it's squaring it and then dividing it by 4 instead of taking it to the power of 2 fourths? What's it? What's that? Operation. Order of operations, yeah. It'll do exponents before it does um, dividing. So our cross-sectional area, hmm, I must have done something wrong though. No, no, that's right, okay. All right, um, the velocity, we're going to use the continuity equation for velocity. So V is Q divided by area. And we've got the Q up here in the constants. OK, so the velocity is Q, anchor reference, divided by the area. So 9.31 feet per second. And then therefore, 
our Reynolds number is going to be, let me write, just to refresh our memory, Reynolds number is the flow velocity times the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. So it's the flow velocity times the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity, which is up here. And I will anchor that reference, because I plan on copying and pasting this entire block of cells to the second iteration. All right. So we've got some Reynolds number here. If this was the, um, the F value. Now, from our previous time that we were iterating with the spreadsheet, when did we know we were done? Like, when could we stop doing iterations? What were the two things that we were using as our so-called convergence criteria? Well, I'm glad we're re uh, revisiting the issue today. The, the convergence criteria is that your friction factor is stabilized. It's no longer changing from iteration to iteration. So one of, one of them is just that the F value isn't changing anymore. Does that refresh your memory on what the other one is? What's the other convergence criteria we should look for? Percentage difference. Percentage difference between the F values. And so that's not changing. So you know, the way that we were calculating whether or not the F value was changing is on a percentage basis. But besides F value, what's the other thing that we should look to see if it's becoming stabilized? Diameter. The diameter, right. Okay, so for iteration two, what we're going to do now, instead of just guessing an F value, this time we're going to use the Jane equation to calculate the F value. So let's do that now. Equals 1.325 divided by the logarithm of K sub S. So here it is, this one. Anchor the reference divided by 3.7, divided by D. Yeah, it's not divided by the time. Well, it depends on how you write it. What I like to do is I just like to divide it twice, and so I don't have to put the parentheses in. And so, yeah, so I would go like by um, our previous diameter was this one. And so that's the same. If I say divided by 3.7 divided by D, that's the same as if I was to have the parentheses here, 3.7 times D, close parentheses. But it's actually fewer keystrokes. It's one less keystroke. So when you're lazy like me, every little bit counts. I'll leave it like this one. Plus 5.74 divided by the Reynolds number so I'll just use the, the last one that we calculated to the power of 0.9. All right. So close parentheses, and then I need to square it. So this F value should be way better than our first guess was, more in the middle range of typical values, so 0 0.0237. OK, so now. The nice thing is, I don't have to type all those formulas in another time. I think what I'm going to be able to do is just highlight all of these, everything that's diameter down through the Reynolds number, and control C for copy. And then I want to paste it starting here. So by pasting it here, it's going to begin with the top range and just paste down below, control V. And so now it's adjusted the diameter formula for this new F value. It's adjusted the area formula to use this new diameter. Velocity is based on this area. Reynolds number is based on the values within iteration two. And so now, let's see. From iteration one to iteration two, did our F value change appreciably? Yeah, it changed a lot. What about the diameter? from 0.45 to 0.53. It's changed a lot. In fact, we could calculate uh, percent change. 
and let's do that. It will be the new value minus the old value divided by the new value times 100. So 57% change on the F value and 15% change on the diameter. So we still got some work to do in iteration three. But what's nice about iteration three and beyond is all we have to do is just copy all of these values, control C, and then paste. We don't have to type any new formulas in because this F value is just, it's calculating a revised F value based on the previous diameter and Reynolds number. So what we should see is that the percent change, hopefully this time, isn't so dramatic. 3.6% change for the F value, less than 1% change on the diameter. If we get to below 1%, we usually call that good enough. So let's go ahead and do one more iteration. And so all we have to do is select that block of cells and copy and paste and uh, let me move this conclusions out of the way here so we can copy and paste the, uh, the percent change. So both the F value and the diameter are changing less than 1%, quite a bit less than 1%. So we could say that the solution has converged. And uh, what does that mean for the diameter? Well, 0.53 feet. That's more than half a foot, and so a six inch pipe wouldn't be big enough. Um, but an eight inch pipe would, because an eight inch pipe would be 0.66 feet. I don't know if we could find a seven inch pipe. If such a thing was commercially available, then that would work as well, but we do know that an eight inch pipe will be commercially available. So, um, all right, so therefore, let's say that we went with the larger pipe. We went with an eight inch pipe where the original question is what pi pipe diameter is needed to achieve 1.5 cubic feet per second. So if we go with that larger pipe and we still have the 10 horsepower pump, that just means you're going to be able to achieve more than 1.5 cubic feet per second because there will be less friction loss at one and a half cubic feet per second for the larger diameter pipe. So if we win it with an eight inch diameter pipe, then it's good news. We can deliver more than 1.5 cubic feet per second, but let's say that they only wanted 1.5 cubic feet per second, and that's exactly how much they wanted. We'd need to put a valve in, and we'd have to close the valve to introduce a little bit of local losses, and then we'd adjust the flow rate with the valve. So that's how we could use a 10 horsepower pump and an eight inch pipe in order to achieve the 1.5 cubic feet per second is with the valve. But most likely this is just a minimum. They want you to have at least that flow rate and we could do that with an eight inch pipe and a 10 horsepower pump. Any questions from the template file or from just kind of the overall concept of the problem? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the pump manufacturer takes the local losses into account when they tell you what the pump can do. So when they say it's a 10 horsepower pump, they mean that's its net power. That when you, after you take into account all internal losses, that's what it's delivering. Okay, let's revisit these announcements. Remember, uh, Monday next week, I guess, what would that be? Monday the 30th of January. Uh, binder check. So Wednesday we'll have class, but if you're at the, tech, the Winter Technical Conference, that's great. I'll get the, uh, the names from Dr. Na on the people who are there at one o'clock. Um, Friday, 
our lecture will be online and then Monday of next week you'll bring in your binders and I'll check those and then give you 1% on your course grade. All right. Have a good day. If you've got any questions on the homework, please let me know. Give me a call on Teams. Stop by my office. Whatever I can do to help.